Hi, all. Thanks so much for joining Speaking of Making Healthcare Work for You, Different Perspectives and Empowering Solutions. I'm Stephanie Fields, joined by my co-host, Dr. Apoorv Gupta. And today we welcome Mary O'Connor, who is the co-founder and chief medical officer of Vori Health. Thanks so much for being here, Mary. My pleasure, Stephanie and Apoorv. And and I should mention you are a medical doctor. You've been a surgeon for most of your career. And so you've recently transitioned into this company, joining and building Vori Health. So tell us a little bit about what is Vori Health and how is it helping transform the industry you're working in? Very excited to be with everyone. Um, Vori Health is a virtual musculoskeletal medical practice that is technology enabled and technology supported. And our focus is really to drive an outstanding patient experience and patient outcomes at better healthcare values by leveraging the power and opportunity of virtual care and virtual services for patients with musculoskeletal conditions and to approach them with the, uh, in a much more holistic way by, by really employing a biopsychosocial model as opposed to the traditional surgeon model of find it, fix it. You know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and you know, we're typically trained. I find out that you've got a problem with your knee joint. There's arthritis there. Now I'm gonna fix it with the knee replacement. And that can work great for some patients, but it doesn't work great for everybody. And even for patients that the surgery works well on, we still have opportunity to make their surgical journey better. And we have a lot of opportunity to help those patients that may not need surgery or where surgery could be avoided. And you've said that there's actually a huge opportunity to avoid surgery for many patients. You said the 20 to 40% of some surgeries and 23% of a different type of surgery are actually inappropriate or unneeded. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how you avoid those situations? So it's actually, I think, fairly troubling that the published, you know, peer-reviewed medical research shows that anywhere from 20 to 40% of spine surgeries can be viewed as inappropriate or unnecessary and 23% of hip and knee replacements. And so when you when you think about that, that's just huge, right? I mean, not only does it cost the health system, and remember, at the end of the day, we're all paying for this. I mean, in some form or another, someone is paying for the healthcare services that we receive. So, and if 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 they were really effective and, and people were getting a lot better, it would be one thing. But we know that that those health outcomes for some of those patients, particularly spine patients, um, is not always so great. So the question is, how can we improve musculoskeletal health in a way that is sustainable, that can impact a huge number of patients, and that supports the, the ecosystem which I would in which I include in in person care as well. So we see our virtual platform as a way of being a very important part of that ecosystem. We don't believe that all musculoskeletal care can be delivered virtually, but we believe that a lot more of it can be than is currently, and that we can serve as an important augment even when in person care is required. It's a, it's a really fascinating issue, Mary, as, as you and I talked about earlier, this is sort of a topic that's near and dear to my heart because we do a lot of work as con- in consulting and care transformation in identifying root causes of variation. Why is it happening and, uh, and how do we get at it? Uh, so before the interview started, you were talking about how complex of an issue this is. And for our viewers that may not be as steeped in this, Uh, recognizing that it's not a simplistic issue. Can you help tease out what are some of the reasons why you think we're having so many unnecessary surgeries happening? So thank you, that's that's a great question. And I want to state that I don't think that my colleagues, my surgical colleagues are bad people and that, you know, they're really trained to try and help patients. 
And I don't think honestly that surgeons are offering patients surgery that they don't think could help them. Okay, now you say, well then how can there be so much inappropriate or unnecessary surgery? That's the complex question. And basically, if you think of it from a surgeon's perspective, patients will fall into one of three categories. Everyone agrees they don't need surgery. Okay, that's easy, non-surgical care. The surgeon says, I don't need to see you. Go, you know, you're gonna go see other providers to do non-surgical care. The, the patient who needs surgery, everyone agrees. Yep, surgery is the right thing. Okay, that's easy. It's all these patients in the middle where it's not entirely clear what is going to help them best where we see a huge opportunity because our philosophy is we're gonna try and get you better without an operation because we believe that we can help a lot of those people get better without an operation. And if you need surgery, we're gonna find a great in-person surgeon to take care of you. And we're gonna support you to optimize you prior to that surgical procedure to help enhance your ability to recover faster to decrease your risk of readmission and having to go to the emergency department afterwards, decrease length of stay, and to support your recovery. Because if you, once you take a step back and really start looking at, a, at that patient in a more holistic way, you understand that there's so many more opportunities that we have to support that patient than what happens in the traditional system. All right, I'll give you an example because it's, I think it's easier and hopefully easier for listeners and viewers to, to, to relate to an example. So most orthopedic surgeons, I know that, I mean, I've been an orthopedic surgeon my entire career, don't pay as much attention to um, the mental mindset, the mental health of, the, of patients. So we don't routinely screen patients for depression, anxiety, pain catastrophizing, but we know from excellent peer reviewed medical publications that those factors influence surgical outcomes. So again, if we are only looking at the patient, I'm the orthopedic surgeon and I'm looking at that patient as a, a patient who has severe knee arthritis and needs knee replacement surgery, and I'm not looking at that patient as somebody who's 68, who's overweight, who may not be eating very well, right? Who's depressed and start to understand, not sleeping. And I start to bring in an integrated team to support that patient in multiple facets, right? I am more likely to have a great outcome with an operation. So, Again, and, and for the patient that is earlier in that journey, you know, maybe if they lose weight and increase their level of physical activity, we get them sleeping better, we get them on an anti-inflammatory diet, maybe their knee pain is going to improve to the point that they don't need surgery and they never need to see the surgeon because they're not bad enough. So therein lies our opportunity. And that's where our health system, in my opinion, has really fallen short. And I'm not, I know that sounds very critical, but it's the health, health system is a product of the way that we pay providers. And since a lot of the system remains fee for service, unless there's a code that you can specifically bill for so that you get paid, you know, who can afford to have a health coach in the office? providing support to a patient to help them sleep better? Who can afford to have a nutritionist see a patient, right? Unless they have a specific uh, indication for which the code will be reimbursed. So, so we, there's many opportunities to improve, but the first is changing the way that we think about treating patients and then transforming that care delivery model, which is what our focus is on at VORI. Yeah, that's really fascinating, Mary. I think you brought up a number of really critical points 
um, and maybe it, maybe it would be helpful to dig into those further. One is exactly what is Vori doing to change that model? It sounds like you're bringing a different team of people together to look at the patient. I'd like to understand that. Is that all in one sitting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of all in one session or is it su successive? I think it might help because what you're really pointed out is the outcomes are changing because you're getting multidisciplinary review of the patient's condition. And there may be some disciplines that are able to figure out uh, there are different interventions we could try before we have to just proceed to surgery. So it's sort of more, more like a one-dimensional surgical view, which might say, well, I'm just going to operate because I think that's, that's what I can do versus a, if I've got four other colleagues sitting around the table with me, maybe we can discuss other options. Is that kind of what you're getting at? I'd love to, love to use that as, as a question as a way for you to help us describe what exactly is Vori doing differently? Okay. Um, so let me describe how we care for patients virtually. I think that would uh, give everyone a better understanding. So patients come in to see us and we start them with what we call an integrated visit. And in that visit, they see in one appointment, right, three specific providers. So they start with a health coach. And the purpose of starting with a health coach is for us to focus on a fundamental question that we don't typically ask in medicine, which is what matters to you? Right? We should be finding out what matters to that patient? And it might be, I want to run a 5K or I want to be able to get on the floor and play with my grandchildren. And it's their back pain or their knee pain or their hip pain that is keeping them from doing that. So we need to focus on the goal of getting that patient to be able to run the 5K or get on the floor and play with their grandchildren, not a specific goal of I'm going to just look at your knee pain. So that's the first, the first thing that we start with is the visit with the health coach. And the health coach will also start getting into behavioral aspects, for example, sleep, <laughs> right? And that, like, how much sleep do you get? And for people that are busy, you know, this is, I always find this is a very sensitive topic because, you know, they're, because I'm, I could improve my own personal sleep habits. Okay. So sleep, why is that so important? How does that promote um, improvement in musculoskeletal conditions? Let's talk about an anti-inflammatory diet, right? Maybe that individual also needs to see a nutritionist. We, we will add nutrition if appropriate after this first visit. So health coach first, what matters to you, start on a couple goals for improving health behaviors. The patient goes into a virtual waiting room for a few minutes while the health coach does a warm handoff to the physician team. So that physician is a, um, a non-surgeon MSK expert typically physical medicine and rehab trained. Now in that physician visit will be a more, what I'll call traditional evaluation where there's screening for red flags. And for the, for viewers that may not understand that term, red flags is a term that we would use in medicine to say, am I worried that maybe you have cancer? Or if you have back pain, is there going to be compromise of your nerves so that you could go paralyzed? These are, we screen for those red flags, questions that would direct us to, to understand, do we need to get that patient to an in-person provider right away? Do we need to get that patient in for imaging right away? Or can we proceed with non-surgical treatment? So for, the, for almost all patients, okay, they can safely proceed. So that physician team screens for red flags, does a virtual physical exam, and you can do an awful lot virtually, and then we'll make a determination if the patient is ready to go to therapy next. And again, most patients, almost all patients benefit from physical therapy next. So the patient goes back into a virtual waiting room for a few moments, and then the physician team does the warm handoff to the physical therapy team. Physical therapist sees the patient and starts them on 
a physical therapy program. So that's the first integrated visit. We have one medical note that all three of those team members utilize. So it is actually an integrated note, which is also something that we don't do enough of in medicine because every, dis every siloed note makes it harder for another person caring for that patient to understand what the other provider is doing for the patient. Right. So typically that patient would then have a follow-up visit Again, virtual visit, so virtual live interaction with their health coach and their physical therapist um, in anywhere from, you know, five to seven days. They're given uh, an exercise playlist, right, of exercises to do, and then they uh, follow up with the health coach. Uh, very soon, early next year, we will have um, motionless sensor, uh, sensorless motion tracking, excuse me. Uh, which is very um, exciting technology so that we'll be able to have quantifiable data as to how many exercises the patient is actually doing. We will be able to give patients qualitative feedback on if they're doing the exercises properly or not. And, uh, and that is super exciting. We, and then we also have, of course, nutrition, a registered dietitian uh, to see patients. So those are the kind of services that we provide. If the patient is, so patient proceeds with working on health behaviors, home exercise program. If the patient is improving, that's great. Maybe they complete their episode of care because they're, they're better in six weeks to 12 weeks. If that patient is not improving, then we collectively as a medical team talk about that patient to make a determination, do they need to get back in to see the physician team? Do they need imaging? Do they need referral to an in-person provider? So that we can um, really make sure that, that we're getting the patient the care that they need. Patients also text us, so they, they can reach us through text. They text the, the health coach text, communicates with them through text frequently so that there's more communication rather than only, you know, let's say it's uh, once a week or every five days virtual visit. And staying connected with patients um, is really important to help them engage in the care program that we know is highly likely to improve them, right? One of the big challenges is how do you get patients? I don't like the word compliance, right? If a pa we, we wanna blame the patient. We wanna say this patient's non-compliant because they haven't done what I, the doctor, have told them they need to do. I actually view that as a failure on our part, right? If, if this patient is not doing what is going to help them get better, then why is that? What are the barriers to the patient doing that? Why is the patient not engaged enough to embrace at least some of, of those um, activities that we want them to do? And again, that's where traditional medicine, in my opinion, has fallen short, not because people don't care, but because they don't have the systems or the resources to do it. What are some of the success stories that you've seen and how big is this opportunity to transform the, the care of people with these types of issues? Well, um, musculoskeletal conditions are huge and they're the number one global cause of disability worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. And if you talk to employers, you know, this is the these are the conditions that impact their workforce the most. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, cancer isn't important. Of course, it's important. Heart disease is important. Of course it is. But people that get heart disease get heart disease because they stop moving, they gain weight, they get diabetes, hypertension, depression. Okay, all of these things matter and I know I might be a little biased here and I know I'm an orthopedic surgeon by background, 
but it's to me, it's all about movement. Because if a person keeps moving, they stay healthier. It is just that simple. And if we fail to recognize the importance of musculoskeletal health, then we allow the development of these other medical conditions to, to become more, more likely to occur in a patient. You can obviously apply this approach to many other areas too. It doesn't have to stop at orthopedics. If you're successful, you could develop an integrated care model in any of these other disease areas too, potentially. Uh, that That's more of your expertise. So I guess my final question is, is I want to know, Mary, is it working to reduce costs? And how do you know, kind of what is the control group by which you know that in so many patients, we were able to avoid surgery and gave them all this additional care potentially that could have been expensive, but in the big picture, it wound up being more cost-effective because the nutritionist, physical therapist combination was just so much less expensive. So can you talk to us a little bit about the outcomes and how you know that those are improving? So that's a great question. And I would say that we are, we're a young company. We're just a year old. And so we will have more robust data as we have more patients and we have some great early partners and working on more partners. So if anybody is out there interested in transforming how their patients receive musculoskeletal care or their employees, please just reach out to me. And I'm sure Stephanie will post my contact information. Um, so I will say that we do have data on our net promoter score as one example of how I know we're making a positive impact. And our net promoter score is 90. We were at 92, we're at 90, but 90 is still like way outstanding, okay? And so I know that what we're doing is, is positive. Pa patients are, are having a positive response to our experience. We can customize what we do for a partner and often for some partners, we will focus more on providing uh, health coaching and virtual physical therapy. For others, they actually want and need that more integrated medical practice approach. So yes, we know that patients are having a good experience and we have many patient testimonials and I would say more uh, solid data will be forthcoming. For some of those testimonials that you've received, what are the things that patients are saying? Is it more around the fact that it's an integrated approach and they feel really empowered because they're able to take charge of this and not necessarily feel like they're just being sent down a surgery road? Or is it something completely different? Is there anything that surprised you or excited you about what you're hearing from these patients? Stephanie, uh, the overwhelming comments that we get back from patients is how supported they feel and connected they feel to a care team. And people need an emotional connection in order to make behavior change. That's another thing that surgeons don't typically focus on, right? But we may think that we make decisions based on data as human beings and we use data, but most decisions are emotionally driven. And so we need to find ways of better supporting patients in the care journey and to do that in ways that the system can afford, which means you have to leverage the power of technology. We also next year, which will be here before we know it, uh, will be creating uh, social communities for our patients. And this is another thing, like, I don't know why we haven't done more of this in medicine. The only service line in medicine that really does this to any extent is cancer, where you have support groups for women with breast cancer or men with prostate cancer, right? But why don't we do that across the board? Because patients want to share their experience and learn from other patients about their experience to support their journey. We can have group exercise classes we can have group educational classes that you can do very effectively and inexpensively through a virtual social community platform. And if you just look at Weight Watchers, Alcoholics Anonymous, 
Why do they work? They work because they create communities and those communities support the individual in their, in their behavior change. So um, all of this, I'll say, and more, because um, there'll be other things that we think of uh, to add um, will, will come. You know, I could go on and on about, you know, how will we incorporate advances in medicine like genomic testing and genomic profiles and more uh, regenerative medicine treatments. You know, all of those are things that we are excited uh, to pursue. We just need a little, we need a little bit more time to get to, to those, um, those areas. Well, I'm excited to see what comes up next. So thank you so much for being here and sharing what you've already done and all the things that you do have planned. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're very excited and I appreciate the opportunity. And again, if anyone has any questions, just please reach out to me and we'd be delighted to, uh, to try and help people on their journey towards musculoskeletal health. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's a very promising future ahead. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.